right, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. My name is Orhan Kaba, and I will be your MC for tonight. I pray everyone is in good health and spirit during these crazy times. I also pray for the people in Melbourne that they are safe and sound after the recent earthquake there. It sure has been some difficult times lately, but inshallah, we are seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this event from the lands of the Darug people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all joining from today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. With that said, I would like to welcome you all to another ISRA online event and the latest instalment of Scholars Corner, where we reach out to intellects and academics from around the world to discuss one of their recent scholarly works. The discussions are facilitated by our very own Associate Professor Mehmet Ozal, and he will be discussing the book Transcendent God, Rational World, a Maturudi Theology with the author and our honoured guest this evening, Dr. Ramon Harvey. I would like to begin now by introducing firstly the facilitator, Associate Professor Mehmet Ozal. Associate Professor Mehmet Ozal is a theologian author and academic, and the founding director of the Centre for Islamic Studies and Civilization, CISAC, at CSU. He is an executive member of Public and Contextual Theology, PACT, a research centre at CSU. He is also the executive director of ISRA, Islamic Sciences and Research Academy, and together we serve the Muslim and broader community with over 100 projects and initiatives every year. He has published three books, developed and written material for numerous courses on Islamic theology, history, and contemporary issues around Islam. Our guest scholar in the corner tonight is Dr. Ramon Harvey. Dr. Ramon Harvey is Aziz Foundation Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Cambridge Muslim College, where he teaches theology in the BA in Islamic Studies. He received his MA and PhD in Islamic Studies from SOAS University of London, his research focuses on Quranic studies, theology, and ethics. Dr. Harvey is the author of The Quran and the Just Society in 2018, and Transcendent God, Rational World, a Maturidi Theology 2021, which of course is the subject of tonight's discussion, both published by Edinburgh University Press. He's also the series editor of Edinburgh Studies in Scripture, Islamic Scripture and Theology. Uh, the discussion will be followed by a short Q&A for you to put any questions you may have to our guest, and we hope to finish up around 8.30, inshallah. So welcome and good morning, Dr. Ramon, who is joining us from England. It's lovely to have you here, and I will now hand over to Dr. Ozal to start the discussion. Thank you very much, Orhan, for that introduction and uh, start. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you, uh, Dr. Ramon Harvey. Welcome to the Skulls Corner. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, we don't always uh, get a book published on, on theology, let alone theology of Imam Maturidi. So when I saw your, your book, I was immediately uh, it, uh, attracted to it. And I said, I have to get this book as, as soon as possible. And if possible, uh, I would like to have a conversation with you. And, and thank you for sending me. Uh, I ordered the book, but it hasn't come yet. But Thank you for sending me a, a, a in confidence version, uh, and uh, I really look forward to the hard copy as well. To help hold it in my hand and, and turn the pages, and I read the book. It's a fantastic book. Well done, uh, and uh, so I would really looking forward to the discussion today, inshallah. So uh, what I'll uh, what I'll be doing is that uh, I'll sort of. Uh, thought about three key areas for us to discuss. The firstly, Imam Matur himself and his legacy. <clears throat> and uh, secondly is uh, epistemology. It's a big question. Um, how do we know what we know is basically is the main thing. That's a big part of your book. Uh, and, uh, and also with some uh, theological issues, you know, from the perspective of you know, Imam Matur I, I, I realize that you've covered a wider ground uh, in the in the book. Uh, we might not be able to cover all of it. It was quite rich uh, when I read it. Uh, so, so obviously, so within uh, this uh, one and a half hours, you know, we'll focus on the Imam Maturidi and uh, his theology 
and, and your understanding of it, your reflection in the book uh, as well. So firstly, uh, let's begin uh, with uh, uh, looking at like who is Imam Matruda and, and why is it important for us today? Um, okay, so I mean, I think it's good um, just to introduce the, uh, who uh, Al Maturidi is um, briefly, and then obviously we'll get into more detailed areas. But some people have no idea who this figure is, or may not have heard of him, or just maybe heard the name. So um, uh, Abu Mansur Al Maturidi was a um, scholar from Samarkand, um, from a small village uh, just maybe outside Samarkand. Um, uh, which is um, in today uh, Uzbekistan in Central Asia. Uh, at the time, obviously, there were different uh, uh, sorts of borders and, and political organization, but it's in that same area. And Samarkand is obviously a well-known city. He, he lived in the uh, fourth Islamic century or into the fourth Islamic century. He was born in, in the third, um, uh, which is the, uh, the t sort of the ninth and into the tenth uh, uh, Gregorian uh, centuries. And he lived a long life um, and he unlike some scholars who traveled around a lot to learn, he basically seems to have stayed in Samarkand and to have studied at a madrasa that existed in Samarkand. And he studied with these Hanafi teachers. Um, uh, and so he's from this uh, sort of Hanafi tradition of scholarship, which is an important uh, element we may come on to. And um, he, um, is, uh, he was a wide ranging scholar. He has a, a large book of tafsir, which has been, uh, still survives and has been published. In, a, uh, in the current uh, vo uh, about 17 or 18 volumes in, in the recent edition. Um, so it's a, a comprehensive tafsir um, uh, uh, explanation of the whole Quran. And he also has an important book of theology called the Kitab al-Tawheed, which is more the focus of my work because of the subject area. And um, he was, uh, as well as these things, he taught uh, uh, fiqh, uh, uh, sort of Islamic law, and he was um, a, a, a legal theorist so he actually had works on usul of fiqh as well. But he's most remembered for his theological legacy because a, a, a major school of Sunni Islam, the Maturidi school, which is often paired with the Ashari school as one of the main uh, uh, theological schools of, of Sunnism, because he was so central to the ideas that came to form that tradition. So he's a very important figure um, uh, you know, for these reasons and particularly for his importance as a theological thinker, and I would say a very original, creative thinker of his time, who um, was a, a key source for what we come to sort of know as Sunni Kalam, um, or at least one major tradition in that uh, uh, area. You say he's original. Uh, he's, he's, some scholars also say that he comes from the Hanafi tradition or he kind of systematized the uh, Abu Hanifa's theology. Do you think, do you agree with that? What is, was he following the Hanifi tradition or was he, um, I guess, developing something uh, new? Yeah, so I think this is a very important question. Um, I, th I think that it, it, there's, there's, there's different things going on that we need to unpack. He certainly is a Hanafi scholar and some of the core ideas views and approaches of Abu Hanifa and Abu Hanifa's students and descendants uh, in, in the tradition do play an important role in his thinking. But um, I do think there is a, a, a step change between Abu Hanifa's thinking and the, the thinking between Abu Hanifa and Maturidi is doing something new on the level of theology in terms of bringing in different rational ideas from the philosophical traditions, he's got ideas from the uh, Mu'tazili traditions, he's got the Hanafi ideas and various other sources that are in his time and he brings them together to do something, uh, 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 you know, at this formative period of, of the Kalam tradition, he brings it together and makes something genuinely new in terms of a rational system. But what he's trying to do, of course, as all sort of Sunni theologians are trying to do, is to uh, d defend core positions within scripture, within the Quran, um, we, um, you know, core e elements of the tradition that's been handed on as well. So in the, in those senses, he's certainly drawing and standing within the Hanafi tradition, but I think it's an exaggeration that some scholars later on, um, they wanted to seek an authority for, for Maturidi that went earlier into the Salaf, into the first few generations. And Abu Hanifa 
is a better source of authority for that kind of claim. So then they said, well, Maturidism is just Hanafism and all that Maturidi is doing is just, you know, he's just basically taking the, the, the beliefs of Abu Hanifa and just, you know, defending them with new techniques. Um, I think that that's only partially true for the reasons I've outlined. It's more than that. He's the, the there is a different type. There, there is a traditionalist Hanafism, um, which is has very little kalam and is just uh, 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 a core aqida, something like uh, the uh, uh, aqida of Tahawi. This is also coming from Abu Hanifa's legacy, but it's a very different approach than Maturidism. So, I think that it's important to distinguish uh, these elements and and not be not always take later scholars views for granted about historical matters but to investigate ourselves and from my own um investigations it's very clear to me that um and, and other scholars have, have come have come to similar conclusions that he's he is uh, an important original thinker in this rational tradition and discipline okay uh, you talk about a maturidi tradition in the, in the book and uh, like, can we say that uh, that Imam Abu Hanifa's like theology and fiqh kind of got separated with uh, Imam Maturidi took the fiqh line and then did something original, as you say, and then other scholars built on that, and then the legal side kind of stayed as the Hanafi school. Can we can, can we say yeah. that? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, uh, it's an interesting question, uh, you know, about uh, about um, uh, Abu Hanifa um, um, Maturidi's fiqh. Um, we don't have any books that he wrote in fiqh, and it seems he was more of a theorist. So I don't think his his fiqh positions were necessarily that original. And in, and when you look into his tafsir, he seems to have fairly standard Hanafi fiqh positions. So that in terms of the legal tradition, I think he was important in um, uh, you know in the theor theorizing of it in in this field of this field of usul, but um, he wasn't necessarily. Uh, uh, making a any sort of decisive contribution to the uh, legal doctrines and the, the articulation of those. He did teach books of fiqh, the books, uh, um, I think he te taught the Asal of Sh Shaybani, the student of Abu Hanifa. So he was a teacher of fiqh, but it seems that his contribution was more in the rational area of Kalam. So yeah, I, I think that this is why, you know, if you look at Hanafism, they the, the Hanafi school in a sense is often the the identity of the school is uh, defined by the fiqh. Uh, the sh and that makes sense. I mean, the shared rituals, um, which are very obviously bind people together in, a pra in practical matters of like how they're praying, how they are wor you know, worshiping and, and, the, and in, you know, particularly obviously more in pre-modern times in terms of this wider legal systems surrounding all their lives, which have to some extent been displaced by national legal systems today for important political reasons but um the um uh the element of uh, uh fiqh is common to all different strands of hanafism and today that's maybe mainly maturidism but in previous times you had these kind of traditionalist hanafis i mentioned um you had um Mu'tazilis who were also hanafis uh, you had the karamiya which is like a, a sect with distinctive beliefs considered heretical by uh, sort of mainstream sunnism um, and you had different other sort of um tendencies and trends all which were you know these figures were Hanafi in their fiqh in their law but in their kalam in their theology they had some quite important differences so I think that this is uh, that what you say is uh, largely right on that point okay well uh, it seems that theology which is one of my favorite I guess I, I can I can consider myself theologian uh, uh, but uh, in our time uh, Sharia or Islamic law has really overshadowed and other issues like political issues, uh, like political Islam and all these things. Uh, Muslim world is going through, you know, big problems. Um, it, it seems to have been ignored, uh, theology, and thanks for, you know, writing a book on this. Like, why should we study theology in, in our time? Is it absolutely necessary or is it just a niche field for some theologians like you and me to, you know, research and write mm -hmm. about? I mean, this is a, a really important question for scholarship. There's always this so what kind of question that comes up. Uh, I think there's a couple of uh, uh, important elements to to an answer to that. Um, first is that um, we have this concept in, in Islam of the communal obligation versus the individual obligation, uh, the, the fard, uh, um, kufaya and fard'ayn. And so 
it's not required that everyone specializes in theology or even that everyone you know uh, in the public becomes very well trained in theology but it's important that some people focus on this area and and, and the reason for that it, and this is obviously my my view that I'm giving here but the reason for the importance of this is that um reasonable people will you know will uh, from uh, all from other traditions and also from within the muslim community will sometimes challenge uh, beliefs and our understandings and they will um you know seek to uh, to to say that certain elements of islamic belief um you know why does this make sense how can we understand this in the light of our experience in the world what answer do you have to various uh, philosophical and you know intellectual ideas that are emerging in the world and we need to have good answers for these things that are true to you know to the revelation that we do believe in as muslims but also uh, are able to credibly respond to these intellectual viewpoints i mean there is a position of just saying well i have my faith and these are my uh, this is my aqidah this is my creed and not saying anything more but that's not very convincing to many of the pe people younger people who are asking questions to people who might seek to in, they've got some interest in islam and, and want to know what it has to say on various areas, as well as just in these kind of wider intellectual debates. So I think it's important that we have a voice, that we're able to engage with philosophy, that we're able to engage with theology today. And, um, you know, if, you know, we, we hold that Islam is true, then just as in previous eras of Islamic civilization, we should have good things to say, good um, rational um, uh, uh, understandings of our faith that we can put into conversation with others and even if people don't accept it at least we've done a good job of justifying um, mm. the, the faith both to, to ourselves to others and to show that it's a you know Islam is a rich um, civilization and a, and, a, and a major you know a you know a major world religion that can stand in these in these places in these debates and I think that there has been a kind of uh, uh, particularly in Sunnism uh, 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 very much a, a focus only on law, on legal er elements, sometimes politics, sometimes on you know the Quran and Hadith. And I'm, I'm also a scholar of the Quran, and, and it's a it's a you know it's an interest of, of mine to just to, to study that. But there is an importance for theology too, and traditionally this was called ilm al kalam. And I in the book I'm I'm saying that this can be extended today into what we sometimes call kalam jadid, kind of renewed theology that can be uh, uh, you know an important strand of thinking today and can you know be be used even in academic environments as well as uh, you know within the muslim community itself and sometimes i see that people without realizing they're going into theological matters you know when they're dealing with contemporary issues like jihad environmentalism you know other things uh, you have to believe comes in you know through basically through the quran but what is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us through the Quran, and I think yeah. there is a big intersection there between uh, ethics, uh, Islamic law, theology, and yeah. I think so, and and I think that uh, you know in the tradition, if you see the way these disciplines worked, you know where you know you have kalam on one side, and then you you go kind of go into usul, and then you go into fiqh, and it's kind of a seamless blend. And what was so convincing about this traditional picture, you know, was was how it dealt with all elements of life and thought. And um, it's much better to study Kalam properly and know the ins and outs than to focus only on what we think are applied questions, and they're therefore more important and more immediate, fall into, as you say, uh, theological questions, but not have thought them through very well, not to have understood the deeper implications and foundations. And therefore, you know, you can be tore apart on these questions. And this is why some of the sort of reformist efforts um, to me, it haven't seemed very serious intellectually because they don't have a strong foundation in, in, the, in the theological traditions. So I think it's important that we, you know, different scholars obviously focus on different areas. And I've got respect for my uh, 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 friends and colleagues who are working on more applied and sometimes more immediate and practical questions. But there is an importance to have this conversation and discussion uh, to these kind of more fundamental theological areas as well. All right, thank you very much. I think that that will do really. That was a fantastic introduction to theology and uh, I now want to go on to the epistemological matters. That is, how do we yeah. know what we know? Uh, what are the limits of knowledge? What are the methods and nature of knowledge? 
And uh, when I read the uh, first time in Hamad through this Kitab al Tawheed, I was really surprised you know, how sophisticated he approached to the topic. And you quote him as well in the in your book, where we, where he famously said, you know, the path to knowledge uh, of reality of things is perception, you know, yarn, reports, akhbar, and inquiry, nazar. Basically, you know, senses, traditions, and or revelation and reason. Um, do you think that you know, Matri found a good balance between these three, uh, or does one outweigh the other? Others. Uh... Yeah, um, this is a fantastic question. Um, I think I think that yes, I think he has a good balance. Um, if we look at these sources, um, you know, really we can see that um, sort of our sense data, as you said, this are. Our, our, our ability to kind of experience the world directly this must be at the heart of uh you know of a of our sort of epistemological system it's the way that we even come to know whatever reports we have of of you know and come to be able to read the quran or hear of it um for example and likewise um you know we need data we need information if we're going to do any reasoning so there, there can be an important point for the the reason and for the, the the mind to inquire into things, but we need the sense state. So I think this is uh, you know, Matt really makes an imp uh, uh, incredible case for this, and it's obviously an important area. And then you have the kind of two other elements, which are this kind of the so-called kind of traditions, and or we could say the the reports of things, which, as you said, is mainly uh, basically are um, uh, the Quran and we could say the the hadiths of the prophets, so at least in terms of um, uh, religion, in terms of Islam. And then you have, um, but it could be other sources as well. And then you have um, uh, your uh, uh, reason, which is you know the, the mind's ability uh, to to reason about things, rational principles. In these areas, he does uh, focus on both, and it's it's not one to the exclusion of the other. There's no kind of uh, ranked hierarchy. Um, he does think that the the, the rationality is required um, for um, verifying reports. Um, uh, and there's two ways that, that, that this is done. One is for these kind of um, individual reports. He basically um, understands that some reports are kind of less than certain. This is basically on the base, you know, this goes into the science of Hadith basically, but the, the chains of narration need to be scrutinized and we need to see are these people reliable, basically, you know, checking the reliability of our sources. And then the second type of uh, report is something that's so well known that there's no, no longer any doubt. It's just come from so many different source uh, uh, um, uh, branches and or, or sources to us so this is like you know sort of in a way common knowledge that's reported about the world things that everyone knows you know who the prime minister of, of your country is or anything like that you know that's ultimately something that's come through reports but it's no possibility that somehow there's a big conspiracy that the person you think is the prime minister isn't really the prime minister you know that's not credible at all so this kind of idea um the so-called mutawate tradition now um so he so matter really, he does have these different elements and this is pretty in a way seems really standard but we must remember that the reason it seems standard is because he's one of the first people to talk about it in this way at least within sunnism um so it's become standard you know he's the reason for that he's the um he's at the source of that there were earlier figures um who spoke about these kind of three sources of course it's but in terms of like putting it at the front of a sunni kalam book he made the model that was followed by so many people, particularly in the Hanafi tradition, in the famous uh, uh, Aqaid Nasafi, you have the same division and so on. So um, that's um, uh, uh, very important. But I think what I'd like to say about the way he reasons and argues is he seeks to give multiple arguments for um, every element of his theology. He will actually bring out arguments that he considers to be more rational. He will bring out the more traditional arguments, i.e., often quoting verses of the Quran and the and the two elements come together and I think obviously he does he is distinctive in thinking that human beings can come to a knowledge of God um, to the existence of God without the use of revelation and um, that's an important element of his thought that he does think that human beings even without the sending of a prophet to them or the reaching of a prophet to them should be able to reason from the world and understand that there is a creator to this world but he doesn't dismiss the importance of revelation for giving us a good picture of 
the quality, the nature of God, the attributes of God, uh, and also for giving various arguments for various, uh, you know, theological matters. He brings the two together and he tries to put them in harmony uh, and actually use them to kind of mutually support each other. And I think, I mean, it's a bit difficult. If you read the book, you can go, you can sort of see, or well, I mean, audience can see how um, he, how I think he's doing this and how this works in a bit more detail. But the way that I think he's working with these sources, it's not a kind of circular proposition where reason supports revelation, revelation supports reason. It's more of a um, kind of um, uh, uh, a, a, a sort of two powerful sources that we have. Um, but as we've said, um, even his sense of tradition and reports is ultimately grounded in the reason. So. I think he he does, and and that's ultimately grounded in sense, you know. So and so 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 I think the reports here, they they once you've got a rational structure in place, um, um, once you've got the human mind working well with its sense data and understanding the world, then it can appreciate what revelation brings to to further our theological uh, understanding. So I would put it in that kind of way, but nonetheless, I think it is it is a balanced uh, approach and. Um, uh, and it's uh, something that's been very uh, influential in history um, in the Islamic tradition. Yeah, thank you. Certainly my sort of experience has been, you know, I've read a number of books from classic scholars of theology, Kalam. But some, I find some of them highly abstract and rational. Uh, sometimes it's really, really boring to read as well sometimes. But I find Imam Maturidi, he's, he's more free. Uh, he, I find him not restricted too much. And then he does, you know, move on to like revelation, reason quite freely. And I feel like he found a really good balance. Now, and one of those outcomes of his approach is, you know, his focus on wisdom. Um, I'm going to jump to chapter five. You talk about this in chapter five. Um, so what, how did Imam Maturidi explain God's wisdom? And is it central to of his theology and, and if so why yeah um yeah i think it's um a very distinctive element of his theology often compared with other schools of thought and also even with later people in his tradition who to some extent start to downplay it for al maturidi um what he thinks is that um we must understand god as as wise um and 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 this hikmah for him is not just the same as saying that God has knowledge. Every um, Muslim theologian, will, I mean, with very few exceptions, perhaps, will say God has knowledge. God has, you know, whether it's understood as an attribute or, you know, just a sort of an action of, of God, if you're more, more tesely, that they don't accept the idea of distinctive attributes. But um, the Asheris, for example, don't have this idea of, of wisdom. And, and I think what's important about wisdom is it's not just what God knows you know god knows everything it's not this omniscience of, of knowing everything it's it's for, for al maturidi it's a kind of purpose behind how god uh, uh creates the world um uh, a kind of deeper purpose but yet it's not kind of an arbitrary will that god just wants it one way it's it's a kind of it's a it's a purpose that we can to some extent to some small extent um sometimes we can kind of see that purpose. Um, so that purpose connects to our um, uh, uh, experience of the world. This is, in fact, one of the reasons why I call the bo uh, book uh, Transcendent God, Rational World. The world itself has this kind of rationality to it, has this understandability. And it's not just an arbitrary feature of the world. It's, it's in a sense, a necessary, mm -hmm. a metaphysically necessary feature of the world. What I mean by that is that God's wisdom is is a sort of eternal aspect of his being of his nature and so it's you know god will never act against his wisdom and so if we know something about if we can use indications in the world to tell us something about god's wisdom it will actually give us reliable information not just on how the world has to be but also how god is and how god acts and so it gives us an access to understanding something about god now this is um, a challenging notion and we have to be very, we have to say that, you know, ultimately we can't comprehend God's wisdom. Ultimately, we can't explain it with anything further. It just is. It's the, it's, it's, a, it's the, it, the, the buck stops 
at God's wisdom, at his attribute of wisdom. But what this, I think, this concept allows al Maturidi to do is to have some of the advantages that are sometimes felt from the uh, Mortezeli school of thought in terms of giving the human, be human beings be able to have knowledge of the world, to be able to understand that God won't do certain things. To, and, and, and I say to also to ground, you know, some elements of, you know, aspects of, of God we understand that, that God will, will speak truthfully to us, that God will, um, um, you know, that there's um, uh, something that is um, deeply purposeful in, 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 and meaningful in his creation of the world and in our place for it, that grounds things like ethics and what is right and wrong in the world, that there are genuine wrongs and genuine rights. And it's not just an arbitrary fiat of God, but it's actually um, uh, grounded in this attribute of wisdom. But at the same time, what it doesn't do is it doesn't put a constraint that's external to God on God. The world does not constrain God because this is all grounded in God's own nature, God's own attribute of, of being wise. And so it doesn't get into a problem of saying, well, there's certain things that God can't do because God is no longer fully powerful um, or something like this. It doesn't make human beings independent of, of God, but but it, it puts all of that within the divine majesty. So I think that al Maturidi, with his concept of wisdom, he's actually able to, you know, if you, and I try to do this in the book to some extent, and it comes up a little bit in the, my previous book, I think it does actually allow um, a, a, a kind of way to solve certain theological problems that have really plagued um, the, uh, uh, you know, Islamic history and even generally come up as theological questions. I think this concept of, of of this attribute of wisdom is actually a very powerful uh, understanding of you know a theological understanding that allows us to kind of rationally understand certain concepts, even things sometimes to do with you know um, free will and fate. These kind of big questions can kind of um, sometimes come down to um, uh, uh, our understanding of, of the of the divine wisdom. So it is an important element, and for various reasons, I I, I sort of show how it's became underplayed and later Maturidis they sometimes mention it but it it starts to be discussed not in the area of the divine attributes but it starts being discussed with relation to prophecy which is a much later part of Kalam books and it's showing a kind of downgrading of its status um, and it's and then the, the the understanding of it becomes quite attenuated in times and it's not what it was with uh, uh, Maturidi himself so what yeah, do you um, think, I think that. What, what do you think that happened? Like the the, the Quran mentions you know Alim and Hakim thirty five times together. Very very. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis yeah. in the Quran. Probably that's what's driven you know Maturidi to also go. Uh, it's very interesting, fascinating that he took it as an attribute, one of the essential attributes. We we now have eight where knowledge, you know. Uh, ilm is is a recognized yeah. attribute, but Hakim is not there. Uh, what what yeah. happened? Like, was it, you think uh, relegated? I, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting question. My own un uh, thinking about this, it it seems to have been there. Even uh, there's a uh, I think a, a student of the student of Maturidi, but he lives f uh, fairly close uh, just after him called. Um, uh, Abu Salama al Samakandi, he's in Samakand as well, in late, slightly later in the tenth, fourth, uh, tenth century, and he is also in his book, um, also writing of hikmah as an attribute. Um, but it, but by the by the time of like the kind of the next century on, as as the kind of Maturidi type of views start to spread beyond Samarkand to places like uh, Bukhara. Um, uh, and um, you know, in this kind of wider Transox Transoxania region, um, uh, there's an encounter with uh, Ashari thought, and Asherism doesn't have this concept, uh, and they argue, you know, there's just God just has knowledge. Um, uh, this is, and, and if you mean either you mean knowledge, or you mean um, if you're talking about like you know the per the perfection of creation or something, then maybe you mean the way that God creates things. Then for Maturidis, that would be this idea of taqween, this attribute of creation. And um, uh, it kind of just got explained as one or the other. I think under pressure probably from debates with Asheris, um, they just decided to, for whatever reasons to that they could explain it either through knowledge or through um, 
uh, 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 they're, they're, they basically had to make a stand on some points to distinguish themselves from Asherism. And the, the Taqween debate was more central to their identity. And that was kept. This idea of God's creative action, um, all of God's actions got funneled into this one attribute. Uh, for al Maturidi, he talks about um, all of God's actions as eternal, and he doesn't see them all necessarily being identical with Taqween. So, for example, for al Maturidi, God's speech is an action, right? Um, well, yeah, for we'll, we'll um, later, Mat we'll, we'll you know, we'll but so it's, uh, yeah. So, uh, Sorry, say you. again. Just, uh, just for the, we'll come to those. We'll discuss the queen and, and oh, yeah. others. Sorry, well. yeah. So, so just to say, um, uh, just to finish that thought. Um, so, what I think is happening, uh, to put it in a nutshell, is that um, the Maturidis are making a stand on this other attribute of the queen, and a hikma, um, uh, you know, is not uh, in common use. And it just seems difficult to defend it for what you know the, the exact details of that is hard to tell but they seem to sort of progressively shift it down and to not feel the need to make it a central part of their understandings um and i think this is probably no, influenced from the yeah. yeah that makes sense thank yeah. you but uh, do you think that we should they should that should be revived the, within the maturity tradition or you know in general islamic theology because when I when I was growing up, especially at the university, I had a lot of you know questions in my mind, and this wisdom was a savior to to one's faith, and I use it a lot when I speak to young people these days who have doubts about religion. So do you know we have a questioning mind, and a lot of uh, we have a lot of knowledge of the world. When you watch David Attenborough's uh, documentaries, you see those purposes come out. Uh, so do you think there is a greater place in our time for wisdom yeah i mean i think that yeah i mean my my whole approach with the book is to kind of in, in go back to al maturidi look in detail at his system try to understand it. it it's challenging i mean um his book is hard and it's there's there's sometimes multiple interpretations but um take those ideas and then see what the tradition can kind of add to it um, and, and later figures and trace some of that and then look at t t t contemporary matters and one of the arguments that I make in the in the book is that we should have this revive this concept of, of hikma um, and it's something that's actually been noted in the wider discussion uh, of philosophical theology that it is an important attribute but it's very hard to say a lot about it because it's it's kind of got a bit of a mysterious element to it because you know ultimately god's wisdom is not something that we can fully comprehend so what i um argue in in the book is that based on what maturity says in some places is that we we is that i i associate this concept with what i call metaphysical necessity which might sound like very above heads but basically um there's this idea of logical necessity right so if something is logically necessary you know we can't oppose that without getting into contradiction we must think this thing, right? So we can think of lots of examples of like two plus two is four or, you know, what, you know, the various kind of things that are logically essential. And this is often used, this is used by Asheris as well. You know, the, this famous thing about, you know, uh, uh, can God create us? He can't lift and these kind of puzzles. They're resolved by saying that these are incoherent, they're logically incoherent notions, right? But what I'm saying for this, uh, for Maturidi is there's this further, we could say metaphysical necessity. What this is saying is there's some things that, we can conceive that God could do those things, but by virtue of his wisdom, he never, ever will. And so the famous, there's a famous example of like, would he put um, his prophets into the hellfire? This is a famous Maturidi example. Maturidi say, logically, there's no logical contradiction. God can place any person into the hellfire. But from his wisdom, we know for certain that he never, ever will. He won't. He does not. And it's necessary that he does not. And we can uh, say that without worry because we're grounding that in this attribute of wisdom. So I think it's a very powerful concept. And it actually, I try to extend it a little bit further to other elements of, of the kind of picture as I, as I, as I, through the book, you can see that. But it's, it's, a, it's a tricky notion and, it, and it, it's, um, it needs further thought and development because it's been, anything that's been downplayed hasn't been developed and used enough. It needs time and it needs space and it need, you know there's a lot of work to get it to be a mainstream concept but personally i think it should be revived all right great thank you that was fantastic um 
Now, we'll leave the wisdom aside. Hopefully, we can get, revive that uh, or others, future theologians, can do that. Uh, one thing that's been a criticism for classic Islamic theology has been this atomism. You know, uh, they talk a lot about, um, you know, the atoms, uh, that they, are, they have substance, uh, you know, Aryan, Jawhar, and, and then Arad, uh, you know, they, they have properties. Uh, why get involved? with physics or cosmology in theology well, why why did they feel it was necessary to get into that sure um i mean i think that um there's two things here one is they didn't uh fully there wasn't fully a this distinction we have today a very kind of clear distinction um between like you know theologians on one hand and sort of scientists on the other there were muslim scientists but many times um, uh, the the major philosophers and scientists, you know, they were basically acting in both fields. They were doing experiments sometimes and, and, and looking at the world and at the same time trying to make rational systems. When it comes to the Kalam uh, figures, they were less interested sometimes in giving a full cosmological picture as w the relevance of, of a cosmological picture just for proving the existence of God and for what we can know about God and the world. So they were interested... When they brought up cosmology, it was for a, um, a, a, a theological aim. But there's a second element here, which is that we should also we shouldn't confuse necessarily what they meant by atoms um, with what is today known as atoms. Right? Obviously, it's the same word, but um, they're a little bit different in some ways. Like the kind of atoms that were posited by the Kalam theologians were a kind of metaphysical notion. I mean, they were, it was kind of interesting they, they saw them as material but what they were interested in is how they worked to kind of underpin um metaphysics it wasn't that they had actually kind of measured or or found the 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 the, the johar and the, the you know the, the constituents the arad you know they would they would they would they would, they would, they would you know they, they weren't they, they were kind of um positing them to explain phenomena of the world so it's slightly different than um what you know what scientists do today um uh you know it's more similar i think to if you go into the philosophy department and they start doing ontology and talking about different you know types of kind of um tropes and these kind of things um these kind of philosophical metaphysical entities it's a little bit more like that than than like what you would find in like i don't know the big uh, uh the, the hadron collider in cern where they're breaking apart things and finding what's there it's a, it's very much a philosophical kind of inquiry and a, and, a, and a system. Now, what's the significance of it? I mean, I think whichever way you look at it, there does need to be a point of contact. And even today, there should be a point of contact between physics and philosophy. And you see these actually uh, 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 degrees and, and, and positions sometimes in universities of physics and philosophy, because there is an importance to connect what we know about the world with what we can sort of rationally understand and try to make a consistent picture of things. So I think there's there's always been an importance of cosmology because ultimately, you know, as theologians, the, the Mutakalameen were trying to understand we're in this world, what's it made up of, how does it fit together, and most importantly, how does this relate to its creator and how does it let us argue to the existence of the creator. So I think what's needed today is to find in the in the realm of theology is to find uh, a cosmological if you like or metaphysical picture that is coherent in the light of what we know from modern science and physics and at the same t and, and makes sense doesn't just seem like some fantasy world um uh, uh that no one can believe in like um if we start saying that you know everything's made up of uh uh, uh earth uh wind you know earth air water and fire you know that's not even credible just to say something like that um and you know some of the you know earlier theologians may have said that generally the sunni kalam theologians went with this idea of atoms and so on but then also how do these concepts make sure that these concepts do allow us to make theological arguments that we want to make so you know as theologians uh, uh we want to be able to say okay the world is like this and that and, and this and this and this is consistent with what we know from science but also um we can still make these core arguments about 
God, about the world, about how you know human action can be explained, all these other things we may want to talk about. So I think there's a delicate job that needs to be done. And in the book, I try to do some of that work in my own way, drawing on Al Maturidi. And he actually, as I think we may come on to, is not uh, an atomist anyway. Um, he's got a different view of how things work. But even if someone wants to be an atomist, they need to find a way to make that 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 system makes sense in the contemporary space and you know that's uh, okay. the job for well, whoever wants thank you i definitely agree that we do we need a islamic cosmology a contemporary islamic cosmology that needs to be updated I mean, the classic scholars dealt with that atomism at the you know the micro or atomic level and they also speculated about the the cosmos uh, the 10 intelligences sometimes i mean mm. they went with the scientific knowledge of their time which was flawed uh, as, and we now have a lot of updates uh, on that uh, one of them is i'm jumping to perhaps another chapter here uh, while we're on this uh, one of them is quantum physics you know uh, i've noticed that you did discuss you brought in double slit experiment uh, in there. That was great. That was very courageous of you to do that. Uh, how does, do you think that quantum physics affects uh, our theological understanding of how Allah operates in the, in the universe? I mean, I think that, and, and you know, quantum Qadr physics well. it goes into, you know, the Qadr topic as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think quantum physics is a really important area uh, of science. I mean, they say it's the um, the most verified scientific theory because every you know everything everything they've ever tried to uh, do in terms of experiments for quantum physics always comes according to these equations that were discovered in the early part of the twentieth century. And I've got an interest in this area, although I am not a you know a physicist. Um, you know, it's it's something that I'm doing in, in an interdisciplinary area. But I do read in this and I am interested in the philosophical implications and theological implications. Now, um, with quantum physics, um, I, I'm not going to try to break it down and people can read about it. But um, we, what we have to understand for theological purposes is that although these uh, experiments and the, and, and the core equations of quantum physics are very well confirmed to the level of, you know, they're, they're considered as certain as any scientific theory is, although sometimes these things get superseded by a bigger theory that explains that and more but there are multiple interpretations of quantum there are uh, of quantum physics there's uh, quantum mechanics there's different ways to explain what's happening and um, um, there's no agreement among scientists of which of these uh, explanations or interpretations is actually correct and so you people might have heard about the many worlds theory and so on there's different um, possibilities the one that I um, I'm using the book or, or, or go with in the book is uh, often is a version of what's often called the Copenhagen interpretation, which is the most dominant one since the 20th century. Um, but this is basically um, the, the version I, I use of, of, with this is uh, uh, is co particularly connected with uh, Niels Bohr, who was one of the uh, important founding figures of kind of uh, quantum mechanics. But I don't, anyone who's interested, just read read those chapters in the book, please, and and you can sort of see more but what i want to say about theology is that because there's these different interpretations in play in, in that can be made um theological views could could very much be influenced by which interpretation one takes mm -hmm. which means that they're not a strong basis for grounding uh theological theories basically because there's these different possibilities of how to interpret it it's very difficult to ground. If you take one interpretation, it would have quite different theological implications. So what I do in the book is kind of don't base any of my core arguments on quantum mechanics. I just base sometimes secondary or kind of interesting elaborations on that. So what I try to do is lay out my theology without relying on quantum mechanics, but then say, well, if we take this kind of common interpretation of quantum mechanics, how would this uh affect our interpretation and then i go into those kind of points so i don't think necessarily it's a big challenge um because of the the wide interpretive possibilities that are there but i think it's interesting to see how it fits in with what we want to say theologically and i try to do a kind of interesting 
reconciliation yeah. so in that if regard. You, if, you the, if you pick the Copenhagen uh, interpretation, the Bohr's interpretation, uh, what yeah. theological implication does that have? Okay, so um, there is a kind of what the Bohr's interpretation does is it makes this interesting um, connection between the human it makes a kind of it seems to make an integral connection between what experiments human beings choose to do so what choices we make what things we do in the world and you know actual uh, uh, sort of uh, quantum phenomena you know so what you know depending you know with these double split experiments and so on depending on what you observe the the the, the phenomena seems to be different and so what is, so what I argue from this and it's and it's much again too much to get into in detail but I argue that this is an interesting this is interesting but what it seems to do and according to some uh, uh, theorists obviously scientists sometimes don't like making these conclusions but as theologians what it's pointing to is that human being and consciousness has this kind of quite central place in reality and that fits mm. in with this idea from my view of it being part of God's wisdom to create human consciousness or create consciousness, uh, rational beings, are the you know and and Mattery makes arguments that the uh, uh, you know the, the world really persists and sustains in existence because there are rational beings that you know that, that um, have these higher purposes. You know, God doesn't just create this kind of empty, uh, barren, meaningless universe for no reason. There's a reason, and that's for the experience of these conscious entities that can come to know God and worship him and so on. So I think that, you know, obviously it's a big, it's a big jump from on the one hand quantum physics and on the other hand, you know, Islamic theology, but I think the links can be made. And I try to in the book show how um, this can kind of come together quite neatly. It's it certainly uh, the results that they're finding, you know, if, if some of the kind of very materialist viewpoints were correct, you know that would give n nothing that would be, be helpful for a theological uh, uh, interpretation. But actually, what we do find that the, these the, there's such a central role for consciousness, it seems, in 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 the uh, and in in reality, is really interesting. Uh, and I think what um, uh, one scholar um, who I draw on, uh, some, uh, his name is Pugliese, I think. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. He says that whatever interpretation one takes of quantum mechanics, what it does is it is it makes this kind of intersubjective world that things are intimately connected and related and that decisions and choices have huge implications in, in, in the universe and in what reality we see. And, and so this is kind of something that I think puts, you know, after um, human beings are sometimes in place, oh, we're just in the, um, a, we're just on a, a galaxy in the middle of nowhere in this vast space. We're just a random accident. This is the sort of narrative we sometimes get. Quantum mechanics says um, human, the human mind is at the heart of even sub, you know, the choices made have these kind of subatomic effects in this very interesting way. And that this is, uh, uh, you know, therefore you can draw from that interesting implications. Well, we could say that the, the entire universe is designed to produce life and the, the one of the products of life is the intelligent and con uh, self-aware human conscious human beings so it seems that consciousness is the finest product of the universe but also at the same time we could say it is the seed of the universe because it's the final product it, it's designed with that end in mind uh, that's fascinating yeah. discussion thank you i'm just going to have, yeah I, I saw a, I've got a lot of sorry can i say one uh, and one tiny point on that I know, I know you want to get through questions, but just, just to say that like one thing that we know, if you want to be scientific about things, the most complex thing that we know of is the human brain. The most, you know, it, it's the most complex thing in the whole universe. They've looked out into the universe. Of everything they've found and seen, the human brain is the most complex entity that we know of. So that's just a fascinating yeah. nugget that we can use even with our uh, scientifically minded colleagues, as it were. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, controversy or we don't know how consciousness arises from that brain. And then whether it's part of the brain or not, it's, a, it's another debate. Uh, okay. That's yeah, it's, a, it's a huge debate. Um, I, was, uh, I hope to, I'm sorry, I hope to rec um, uh, come on to that in a, in a future book. 
um, I actually have a uh, I've started doing research for things like consciousness and those big questions but that will be in a follow-up hopefully oh fantastic we'll look forward to that okay well let's return back to uh, Imam Maturidi you know in I'll ask two more questions and then we'll move on to the uh, questions from the audience um, in chapter four you you sort of summarize kind of nicely you say the divine nature is timelessly eternal metaphysically necessary and possessing substantive attributes can you expand on that what do you mean by this okay so um these are all related to that, so. yeah i mean these are all important elements basically the timelessly eternal this refers to that um god is not in any sense within time according to maturidi god doesn't um he as it's he acts he creates the, the world but he doesn't create it from a point of time he creates time itself and he always exists as we say we can say outside of time it, it, it as, as a manner of speaking um and so this timelessness refers to um that he ne does not enter into time um he makes time time operates and he acts of kind of we could say eternality um uh, so that's important and, and also uh, he doesn't become some theologians uh, in the contemporary space might hold that god is timeless before so to speak creating time but once god creates time he then enters into time with the universe maturidi would not hold that and i i don't hold that either then the second thing is um this metaphysically necessary so as i sort of already elaborated a little bit the logically necessary is something that we can't um conceive not to exist so some scholars hold to what we can call the ontological argument for god's existence what this means is that you make some kind of argument that we necessarily we must understand there has to be a god you know and maybe we just need help with, with an argument to show that so for example a very famous uh, one was uh, made by saint anselm a christian theologian um it's sometimes held that uh, ibn sina um, made a version of this argument also there are versions by for example Descartes and so on um, but um, the, the, the core of this argument is that to, to understand that God exists we don't need to draw any premises from the world from our observation of the universe but rather we can just solely see that it's a rational necessity that there must be a God so what I um, am understanding that Mat Maturidi does not have an ontological argument of this kind and what I'm understanding from this is that um, god by being metaphysically necessary it, it's still necessary god exists and must exist but not by virtue of logic but by virtue of actually existing and and, and necessarily so so because god's timeless we could say um he's always existed because he, he's outside of time and therefore necessarily always does exist um and likewise because he's necessary to exist he must be also um, uh, uh, independent of time but the way that we reason to that has to be through the looking at the world and then going from the world a kind of a version of the cosmological argument we could say and then the final thing is substantive attributes that's another word could be distinct attributes what this is is um, the common position of uh, Sunni Islam that God has for example as we talked about wisdom God has power God has speech God has these various attributes and even actions for Maturidi, all of God's actions are eternal, uh, we could say, um, attributes in a sense as well. Um, these are um, distinct attributes, distinct qualities of God. It's not that God is a sort of simple entity. Some theologians and philosophers have held that God is a kind of simple, single, simple entity. What Maturidi is saying is, no, God has all these different qualities. Um, um, of course, he has them in a transcendent way. And they're not for example they don't compose him like a like in a bodily way or anything like that he has them in a special way that we can that a lot of the theological work is taken in trying to define how this is in a acceptable way but basically there is a defense of that god has speech that god has will that god has knowledge and these aren't just the same thing or and or they aren't just all um you know god isn't just some simple entity that does these things he has these different properties um, and this is um, defended rationally, but obviously it has its roots in uh, also in scriptural language, where we the, the 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 you know the God that we read in the Quran isn't isn't this kind of simple 
entity. It's a God who is one, but who has all these different qualities, beautiful names, actions, has knowledge, has wisdom. Um, you know, he speaks and we know the different things that he's spoken. So to defend this kind of understanding of God, the, the Maturides would argue, um, and the Asheris too, that we must have th this defense of these distinct attributes. So hopefully those different elements of what I've just explained will sort of break down th that, that sentence a little bit. Fantastic. I'm really enjoying this discussion. I hope everyone else who are listening also enjoying, enjoying it. Uh, we'll have a bit of a short break. I'll pass it on to Orhan uh, to remind us a few other things that Isra is doing. And then we'll come back to with the with the questions from the audience. Back to your hand. Okay, thanks for that. Um, that was a great discussion, a real deep dive into the, the theology, and um, I'm sure there's a few heads spinning out there, and there must be many questions arisen from that talk as well. So we'll soon commence the Q and A. Uh, but before we start that, and while I have you all captive. What better time to inform you of some of the great university courses we have available at ISRA and SISAC. Uh, Associate Professor Mehmet Ozap, who is facilitating tonight, is one of the lecturers at SISAC, specialising in theology and history. And if you've been inspired by tonight's discussion and are looking to study Islam, we have various university courses that you may want to consider, including a Graduate Certificate in Islam, Culture and Society, Graduate Certificate in Islamic Studies, Bachelor of Islamic Studies, Master of Islamic Studies, Master of Classical Arabic, and uh, enrolment for all these courses is open now, and the course will be starting in 15th November uh, this year, so not too far away. And we also have the brand new Graduate Certificate course in Islamic Psychology. Now, this course will commence, it's a brand new course, and it will commence in uh, 2022, and there will be a panel discussion and launch on October 16, 2021. So that's not too far away to launch that. So it's a new course starting in the new year, but there will be a panel uh, discussion and launch coming up. So um, more information can be found at the, at the ISRA website, isra.org.au. So please, if you want to study Islam and theology further, check out the website and inquire within isra.org.au. So that's enough from me. I'll hand you back over to Associate Professor Mehmet Ozab and Dr. Harvey for the Q&A session. All right, thank you very much, Orhan. Um, all right, we'll, we'll go to, uh, well, before we go to, uh, uh, this, I think I must ask you this question as well, uh, which is the attribute of Tequin, the creative action, as you kind of uh, translated in your book. Um, why is that so central to, Maturidis, Imam Maturidi, why did they insist on that uh, attribute so much? Um, okay, so um, this, um, obviously, um, all all um, Muslim theologians would want, you know, argue that, you know, or, or say that God creates the world. Um, and so they want to explain, you know, what is it about God's attributes that um, mean that the world, uh, God creates the world? And so the attribute of taqween, or, or you know, it's I created it, I translated it as creative action. Sometimes we're seeing in the literature existentiation and things like this, but I didn't. I found that a bit um, wordy, so I tried to say, make it more clear that it was just a creative action. But um, in any case, um, what they felt this was the attribute that gives this link. So God has power for Maturidis. God has power over the world. This means that he's he is able to you know to cr create whatever he wants he's got the power to do so and he's got a will which would you know be the decision to create but there still needs to be an action that is the actual creating of the world because there are things that god has power over that he doesn't actually create so this action is the action of creation and so what matt really say is all of god's actions as i've said are eternal if god speaks it's eternal if god creates it's eternal everything that god does if god is pleased with someone or this displeased this is um his eternal action um even if the effects of the action happen in in time you know because obviously all creation happens in time by definition um so um the maturi you know maturidi and the later maturidis they felt that we must make they must make a stand on this action to say that this is a uh an element of of the divine nature and as one of god's actions it has to be eternal 
um, this is you know what it means for God to create the world is to have this this uh, action. Uh, Asheris, uh, for example, um, really said that there is just God with his for his power and his will, and what he wills that he creates that, and then that is the creation. And there really isn't a strong distinction between the created thing and creation. All the creation is is that there, you know, that we can understand. It's just a concept that we have that God has made this appear. Um, so God's made, I don't know, a, 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 a cup appear in, in, in my room. He's created that. All that it means for God to create that is that there is this cup and it links back to his attributes of he's got a power to do it and a will to do it. But what the Maturidi said is, well, where's his actual action of have of actually creating that cup you know he has to we have to uh def, we have to say that he is actually creating the actual uh cup so um this um you know uh because of their p position on the divine actions uh, and their eternality um they include it and it was always an important marker of um sort of maturidi identity versus the asheris even in the later times when the two schools came quite close together um uh, in many ways, they always held this distinction. Sometimes uh, more contemporary scholars or later scholars try to say it's kind of just a verbal difference between the two schools. And this was normally done in the interest of kind of bringing Sunnism together. So it's a kind of political or identity project. But in terms of the theological systems, um, I think that there is a meaningful distinction here. Uh, and there always has been. And it's a way of doing theology, a way of thinking about uh, what is most coherent. Um, Maturidis, uh, they make power only about potential. Like, what does God have power over? It's it's the potential to create. We could say, even things he doesn't create, he's still got the power over. So the the cup that the, I don't know the 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 other type of cup that he didn't create, right? And he has power over that too. He could have done it. That's how Maturidis see it. For Asheris, power includes actually making it happen so that's why mm. some considered it to be a, a verbal disagreement um but um you know for the um uh Maturides, um there was this important distinction um uh, of god's action has to be affirmed so this is kind of uh, some of the debate and there's other elements to it and other controversies that may come up and uh for those who are interested um i've got a chapter on it in the book chapter six um so you can hopefully read that and understand the sort of the deeper right. discussion there well uh, we've got 20 minutes and we've got a lot of questions from the audience uh, so let's uh, go through them uh, and inshallah we can answer no rush but uh, i guess if we can be concise uh, so here's a question it says does the matru the creed differ from the aqidah of ahlul sunnah wal jamaa Okay, um, so um, in the early um, year, like uh, Maturidi himself didn't use the term Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, he used the term Ahl al Haq, which was another term that was used to mean like people of truth. Um, uh, but, but later, Mat even like a general, I actually have an article showing that even uh, his student, uh, a figure called uh, Abul Hassan al Rustukhfani in Samarkand, did start using that term. Um, uh, and other Hanafis were already using that term, and later Maturidis all use that. And they actually uh, say that they are the Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, um, and um, you know they, they that's how they refer to themselves. But obviously, um, this is a really more a question about the definition of Ahl Sunnah or Sunnism. And what you can find is that uh, different groups have claimed this title of being the true Sunnis, and over time there's generally been a kind of wider and wider acceptance that more and more of kind of the Sunni world can be considered within Sunnism. Although even today, sometimes you get groups and figures saying, well, we are the true Sunnis and these other groups are not. So it really depends on, it certainly, the Maturidi tradition certainly saw itself as Ahl Sunnah. It's a very, eventually became a very widespread tradition all over the Muslim world, particularly in the non-Arab speaking lands. Uh, from China to you know Turkey to um, uh, all of Central Asia, India, they would all uh, you know into actually um, uh, you know actually into Arab speaking lands at times into Syria, Iraq, you know all of we had wide anywhere basically that Hanafis were there would be Maturidis too, and um, in that sense um, they certainly have a claim 
to being the one of the most widespread uh, aqidas in the Muslim community and numerically, possibly, um, in the sense of just being a Hanafi and then the associated creed being kind of automatically the Maturidi position, arguably the, the single largest group of Muslims. So I think there is a good claim, even on the identity level, of um, saying, well, this is the biggest single group um, uh, at times in history. Question, it's hard to test the question comes from, I think, uh, in our modern time, you know, uh, the word Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is used in the Western countries by uh, Salafi or you know people who uh, more, more follow the Athari line or the Hanbali line. Um, I think the, the term has been. It's good to you know highlight. Okay, you are Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but it's been. Uh, branded, I guess, that particular understanding has been branded with Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. The implication being, if you're not part of that understanding or that group, you're not Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. So, so we've got sure, to really sure. No, I mean, the this is yeah. I mean, this is a, a, a it's an identity claim, but that has never been the major majoritarian claim. At least not for, I mean, I don't know if you want to go right back, but in, you know, the last centuries of, of, of Islam, this kind of uh, sort of Maturidi, you know, the creed of Tahawi, the creed of uh, Maturidi, or even we'll say a creed of Nasafiyah, these kind of creeds have been very widespread and popular amongst the people. Obviously, if one wants to make an argument that all the true Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, you can make those kind of claims and there can be a debate, but... Um, it's very difficult to, to, I think, substantiate the idea that you can't call this Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. I mean, it's been widely accepted as such for a very long time uh, amongst the Muslims. But, you know, that there are the particular debates that can be had, but I think maybe it's not the place to pursue uh, okay. uh, some of those polemics. Yeah. yeah. All right. Here's another question. Uh, what makes Imam Maturidi's approach to Akal reason unique? And what separates him from the Mu'tazila and also uh, the traditionalist line representing by Imam Tahawi? Right. Yeah. So um, I tried to go into some of that in, in, the, in the conversation we had. Um, I would say that he, he takes ideas from the Mu'tazila, but he combines it with these Hanafi ideas also with philosophical ideas it's hard to find you know to just come up with a simple sentence that says this is exactly how he understands the akal that um you know in a nutshell you know, encapsulates what he's doing but he basically has a distinctive he develops his own distinctive position of theology that isn't like quite like anything else it's his own way of conceiving of it so it's hard i think i'll just have to say like in the book i try to really kind of address that it, you know the way that he looks at the world the way that he that you know the, the the sort of it's it's this interesting position that is it, there's a there's a wide there's a, we could say there's a widespread perception that the Mottezala went too far in asserting the the primacy of akal right and so Maturidism is sometimes said to be part like halfway between Asherism and Mu'tazilism. I don't fully agree with that in the sense that I think it's too simplistic, but it definitely he he makes a space where he's gives almost or equal importance to Akal as um, Mu'tazilis Mottezili, do. It's really the rationality is really central to what he does, but he tries to not let that compromise on the core of religion so for example he still believes you know that believers will see god in the hereafter um this the you know the 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 ru'ya bil absar the people will the believers will see god he holds to that um he still believes in distinct attributes which the mu'tazila in the interest of their rational program got rid of he still um holds so he holds what we could say these characteristic sunni positions on things um, but at the same time, he says human beings, you know, can know and are and are responsible to know God with their reason. That's a position he takes from Abu Hanifa, um, you know, as it's said. And and human beings are able to come to judgments about good and bad themselves 
without revelation, at least on key and core moral aspects. So I think that this what the the the, the unique thing here is it's the it's the most rational position that can still claim to be within acceptable ahl sunnah wa jama'ah so i think that makes it very very useful for the contemporary world it's it's the most rational you can be but without falling into the problems that were widely held to be uh, the mu'tazila to fall mu'tazila to fall into um and to stay within sunnism so this is um uh, what makes it kind of interesting and very actually useful uh, for for kind of contemporary ethics and so on um I think there was another question there, but I've forgotten the but last bit. If there was another bit, more comparison between Maturidi and Tahawi. Well, oh, Tahawi, yeah. So Tahawi is interesting. Tahawi, basically, the answer to that is that it seems that Abu Hanifa, he used to teach Kalam, right? Very early. Like I don't, I've I've got an article coming out that's showing. That I don't think the the Fiqh al Akbar, which is commonly taught as Maturidi, is not the one tra said to be transmitted by Hamad. I don't think this is Al Maturidi's, uh, uh, sorry, Ab Abu Hanifa's Abu Hanifa. own text. Hanifa. Yeah, it's not Abu Hanifa's own text. It's it's a later text. But the um, mm. the one that's uh, written, the, the one by Abu Muti Al Balki, which is a, who's a student of Abu Hanifa, is genuine, I think. But what I'm saying here is that Maturidi he used to teach Kalam in the early days, and then for various reasons or his own choice, Abu Hanifa himself stopped teaching Kalam, right, um, to his students. Mm. He just taught Fiqh. And so people who took from his kalam when he was teaching it, that's the kind of, the, the as we talked about, the roots of the Maturidi tradition coming out of that along with other sources. Mm -hmm. The people who just took, when he didn't stop teaching kalam, they took this kind of, what we could say, a more traditionalist uh, uh, Hanafism. That's the sort of thing that Tahawi is taking on. So Tahawi, he, you know, he, he becomes a Hanafi, he's a Shafi originally, he becomes a Hanafi, and he is a muhaddith as well as a faqih and he um has this he doesn't have really anything any kalam works um but he just um has fiqh works and hadith works and so on and then he um writes this creed which is very much like the creeds of like the, the hanbali scholars or the scholars of the ahl hadith uh, of you know ibn hanbal and others um but there are some some distinctive positions in there which show that he's still got this kind of hanafi flavor to it um, for example, he says God is not in any of the directions, so as a kind of trans transcendence in that, he um, um, mentions um, uh, something that indicates he thinks that um, something close to a taqween type position. Um, uh, so, but but he doesn't go into any sort of speculation, and so this is the the Tahawi um, style of uh, traditionalist Hanafism. This carried on for a few centuries, and you get people into the sort of fifth century. Um, still following that but then Maturidism really starts to dominate everywhere and what the Maturidi started to do is to write commentaries on Tahawi's creed and when they wrote those commentaries they then started to bring in Kalam concepts to explain Tahawi and bring Tahawi into uh, 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 Maturidism and then later on even after like we have Ibn Taymiyyah coming in, in Damascus um, we have um, is it Ibn Abi Iz who is a Hanafi who writes a kind of um, uh, a commentary of Tahawi in the kind of Ibn Taymiyyah style um, with that kind of tradition sort of Taymiyyah traditionism so you get people and then you get Ashari's writing on Tahawi and everyone's trying to claim Tahawi as like because he's an early person early member of the Sunnah they're trying to claim him for the, themselves depending on how they comment on him but um, uh, he, in his original position I think he wasn't a Kalam figure at all he was a traditionalist Hanafi um, presenting what he took as the teachings of Abu Hanifa from his transmission line. Hmm. There's a, I guess, related question to that here, um, which says, like, could you please uh, discuss the theology tradition in Samarkand before Maturidi and including Maturidi's uh, teachers? So what was the okay. tradition like in Samarkand? Yeah, so we don't have a lot of information about that tradition. Um, we know that one of the um, students of Abu Hanifa was Abu Muqatil al Samakandi, um, and he um, the author of this uh, uh, Kitab al Alim wa Muta Alim, which is often attributed to Abu Hanifa. But really, what it is is it Samakandi is writing down um, Abu Hanifa's responses to his questions. So he's the Muta Alim, and Abu Hanifa's the Alim. Um, but um, then we get a kind of gap and it's not so clear what's going on but at some point 
um, there's this uh, something called Dar al Juz um is a, is a madrasa that is set up in Samarkand, and I think it's Abu Nasser is uh, al Juz Janiyah is his main te Abu Hanifa's main teacher, and then what happens is that um, uh, so he learns in this tradition. This is like the students of the students of uh, a Shaybani um, seem to be the main line of tradition here. So it's a, you know all, you know so it's a few generations from a Shaybani people study with um, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani in uh, Baghdad um, or you know more than Kufa really at that point and then they um, come back to Samarkand and set up uh, uh, you know teaching circles and eventually this madrasa and then um, the son of uh, Abu uh, of, of Abu Nasr uh, Juz, Juz Janiya, I think it's Abu Ahmed um, he basically um, after his dad father dies he becomes the um, um, uh, or I think his father maybe is, is kidnapped or captured or something. But he he uh, he becomes the um, the head of the madrasa. But then everyone everyone goes into an uproar, and Abu and uh, everyone says, "Well, look, Al Maturidi is the most senior here. He might not be the son, but he's the the, the top scholar." And so then he ends up ends up getting installed as the teach as the uh, main um, person there. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of the followers of. Uh, the the son I think uh, Ahmed Abu Ahmed um, he um, they go on and, and start a rival um, uh, madrasa called the called the Iyadiya right so you have these two strands and in um, mm. uh, this an article I've written about the students of after Abu after Maturidi passes this Abu Hassan al Rustukhfani he becomes the um, the new head of the madrasa and he carries on teaching broadly according to al-maturidi but also bringing in ideas from um, al-hakim al-samakandi who's another figure associated with the other trends so you kind of got this more rational trend rationalistic trend in the darul juz janiyah and you've got this darul or yadiya who are this more slightly more traditionalist trend within samakand and then what seems to have happened is that uh, rustukhvani actually is in a way reconciling a bit between the two and he's kind of more and even though he's in one he's kind of bringing in some of their ideas and then by the end of the century um or into the next century people forget about there ever being this distinction and they start to just draw from it all and just talk about um the position of our you know ashabuna or you know our people our companions as well as sometimes saying al maturidi is the rais he's the head so by the end of the kind of um fifth century um by the time of um uh abu yusr al bazdui um, uh, he, uh, who's like uh, Qadi in Samarkand and so on and writes this important book called Asul al-Din he's just saying um, our scholars say this and Al-Maturidi is the head of is like the most important basically and they start to treat him as the most important figure and over time even centuries later they start eventually to be known as Maturidis but for most of the time they just call themselves um, Hanafis or um, you know, Ahlusun or Jama'at and so on. So this is some of the sort of background in Samarkand. It's an interesting time and uh, an interesting period of scholarship. And it wasn't widely ex known for a while. It was kind of just localized. And then it spread to like uh, Bukhara about the time of uh, Bazdawi. And then it started to kind of really in the centuries after spread throughout the Muslim world. That was fascinating. Thank you. That, that, that history is great to know. We, we don't know much about the Samaritan tradition, or at least it's not a common knowledge amongst Muslims. Yeah. And here's a, a clarification uh, question. Uh, mm. I think they're quoting your, what you said, uh, uh, quote, the emphasis on God's wisdom was relegated to prophethood centuries later, unquote. Uh, do you discuss this in your book? Uh, uh, like, can you elaborate on this, please? What happens um, uh, post and why? Why do you think this has occurred? Yeah, um, I do. I, I talk about it a, li a little bit. It's not like a, a big. I think it's a few paragraphs, maybe, if that. But basically, um, I think um, what happens here is that um, they there's a, there's a position is is obviously before we have the the centrality of wisdom. In the um, one of the things that happens is that they um, uh, they start to say that they start to use it in terms of in prophethood. They say, well, um, you know, it's it's from God's wisdom that He sent prophets, which makes sense. And I'm sure Al Matur, you know, Maturidi would say that too. But um, 
they don't want to introduce it into the main core um, attributes because increasingly they start to sort of match the sort of Ashery seven. They, they start to sort of line up that we have the same seven attributes, you know, the famous seven that the Asheris hold, plus everything else we want to talk about is eighth, which is Taqueen, which is this, uh, you know, creative action. And they don't want to say that there are any other attributes. So they stop talking about Hikmah in the first part of the books. But later on, when it comes to talking about um, the, the, the prophets, they say, well, it's from God's wisdom that he, that he sent prophets. And then they use this interesting... Um, term they say that it's for a praiseworthy result akiba hamida uh, and this is um something that is coming um from maturidi and they say this is what maturidi said wisdom is akiba hamida but it's actually not for as far as i can see it's not found in his kitab al tawhid it's in his tafsir and he at one point says it and even in some manuscripts it doesn't even fully only has i think one of the um uh, uh, words there but um it's this it's it's kind of I think taken out of context, and then it is made to say, well, God's wisdom is just what has a praiseworthy result. But of course, this is slightly circular because what defines praiseworthy? You know, how are you going to you can say that this whatever has a praiseworthy result um, uh, is what is um, uh, is God's wisdom? Well, what's what's praiseworthy here? How do you define it? Uh, surely. You know, so I would say that and um, when Maturidi maybe used that phrase, he, he was using it in a slightly different context, perhaps. And what really should, and what I say in the book is that wisdom in for Maturidi is the final grounds. Once you get to God's wisdom, you can't explain that with anything else. You can't say, well, it's, you don't explain it like, oh, it's wise because it has a good result or it's wise because it is helpful for people. Otherwise, you fall into what the Mu'tazala said, where they said, God does what is asla, what is best for the people. Right. You don't you can't say that because then you're going to fall into um, uh, uh, defining God through the creation, um, which Maturidi is, is very key, uh, uh, clear not to do. But then later Maturidis, I think they fall into this kind of trap of saying well, it's a praiseworthy result. And I think it becomes quite vacuous because how are you going to explain what's praiseworthy? The whole purpose of wisdom, in my understanding of Maturidi's theology, is it is the final ground for any kind of moral status. Anything is ultimately good or bad because it's from God's wisdom as an eternal attribute. That's the ground. You need a grounding for these things. Otherwise, you end up in either Asherism, which says good is whatever God commands by definition, mm. and you get a kind of divine command theory, or you fall into Mortezalism, which says, you know, good is somehow what's good for us as people. And then you're defining morality via a sort of almost subjective or even if it's objective ultimately a human valuation um which is not then grounded in really in god himself and his attributes so um so yeah so this is what i think somewhat's going on i i do sometimes feel that and I, this is a wider argument i'm making in the book that the later maturides in in seeking to sometimes find a, a defensible position in seeking to some extent this dialogue and uh, uh, um, um discussion with asherism they sometimes sacrificed the consistency of what of what Al Maturidi was trying to do um, in in the kind of formulations that they came out with. Um, so I so I'm sometimes a little bit critical of the later tradition for doing this in places. But um, ultimately, that's kind of my argument and my judgment. And I'm not, uh, you know, I don't hold anyone else to have to agree with me on that. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramon. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm sorry, everybody. We ran out of time. There were other questions. Uh, there were, like this could go for another half an hour or an hour if we uh, tr tried all the questions. But it has been extremely beneficial. I hope you had a glimpse of the book uh, and the topic, Imam Maturidi and his theology. And uh, please purchase the book. Uh, and that's the that's it. Uh, and uh, yes, it is the book. And, uh, Ramon, you said a paperback version also, or you're working, you're yeah. working on or something. Yeah. Actually, um, yeah, there's what, what normally happens uh, in this series and uh, um, is in, in, in any Edinburgh University Press books is that after 18 months after publication, a paperback drops and that's more affordable. So that's uh, it was published in June. So that would be I mean, if we add 18 months to June 2021, it's still a while. Um, but um, 
I am um, hoping that there'll be other ways to make it uh, more accessible as well. And um, uh, hopefully there'll be an exciting announcement soon about that. So, um, right, yeah. Right. Uh, follow, um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I announce everything to do with the book and my various things on Twitter. If you use Twitter, um, uh, and that's probably the best way to keep up to date with what I'm doing. And I'd like to say uh, uh, thanks a lot to yourself uh, for your uh, in, you know, interesting questions, for all audience, and for being hosted, um, uh, the center, um, everyone involved to make this uh, uh, event uh, work today. Um, it's been really nice working with you all, and I hope we can uh, do it again sometime. Thank you very much for being a guest to Scholars Corner, and we'll now pass it on to Orhan. Off to you, Orhan. All right, thank you very much, Associate Professor Mehmet Ozov, and also a big thank you, Dr. Raman Harvey, for availing us of your time for this great discussion. I really enjoyed it, and we look forward to your future work and some exciting announcements. Thank you very much. Please, uh, as the Dr. Raman says, follow him on Twitter for further announcements. Okay, so please uh, look out for some more Scholars Corner discussions coming up. We have one coming up by author Alan McHale to discuss his book, God's Shadow, the Sultan that created the modern world. Uh, details will be, released, will be released soon. We don't have a date yet, but please go to the website um, and look out for that one in the future. And we hope to see you again soon, inshallah. Thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ramon Harvey. Thank you, Assistant Professor Mehmet Ozal. Uh, Salam alaikum and good evening, everyone.